On August 29, 2021, Hurricane Ida made landfall in Louisiana. This Category 4 hurricane had maximum sustained winds of 150 miles per hour at landfall and caused at least $50 billion in damage, including causing an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Soon after the hurricane passed, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, released images of the affected areas. These images revealed the oil spill before state and federal authorities were able to reach the stricken area. Gathering information about something without making physical contact with it is called remote sensing. This technology allows us to explore in ways we could not otherwise. In some cases, more is known about the surface of Mars than parts of the ocean floor. Exploring other planets is also a form of remote sensing. Remote sensing plays a role in our everyday lives. When you fly, it's used by air traffic control. And weather forecasts are available because of remote sensing. Today, we will explore how NOAA uses remote sensing. And the role that it plays in our lives. This, this is, is STEM in 30. 30. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. And today we are at the NOAA Satellite Operations Facility in Suitland, Maryland. Soon we'll be heading inside to learn all about the work that goes on here. NOAA studies the skies and the seas. A diverse team of scientists, engineers, researchers, pilots, technicians, and others work every day to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts. They share that knowledge and information with others and help to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. North Pacific right whales are among the most endangered animals in the world, with fewer than 100 individuals estimated remaining. NOAA just completed the first large whale survey. They saw and were able to collect valuable information on four North Pacific right whales south of Kodiak Island, Alaska. Climate change is altering the North Pacific right whale's habitat, making it important to learn more about this critically endangered species. They make forecasts that help us see what the weather will be like tomorrow, predict the path of hurricanes, and understand changes in climate. But what does this have to do with air and space? NOAA's vast array of tools includes satellites, aircraft, weather balloons, and uncrewed aircraft, or drones. Satellites collect data from hundreds or even thousands of miles above the Earth's surface. This data helps us study climate change, weather patterns, and ocean currents, among other things. NOAA maintains a fleet of aircraft that help monitor our environment and conduct research. Some of these aircraft even fly into hurricanes to gather data to improve warnings for affected areas. Weather balloons gather data from the layers of the atmosphere. They are launched twice a day from around the country and help improve the weather forecasts you see every day. Drones are used to count animal populations, fly through hurricanes, and survey tornado damage paths. On land or at sea, and even in space, NOAA's work helps us paint a picture of our ever-changing world. While we're here at NOAA, we are gonna learn all about remote sensing. But what does remote sensing really mean? And how does NOAA use the information that it collects? If you wanted to know the temperature of the ocean, how would you take it? Would you be able to do it in only one spot, or could you find a way to do it across the entire ocean? What if you wanted to see how an area was changing over time? Could you track how the shape of the coastline changes due to erosion, rising sea level, or a strong storm? Or have you wondered where animals like whales and sea turtles spend their time in an ocean? Do they move from area to area based on the season or changing ocean conditions? NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, works to answer these questions and more. One way is by using a technique called remote sensing. Remote sensing is the science of obtaining information about an object or an area from a distance. Typically, NOAA uses sensors on board a satellite or aircraft to collect this information. These sensors can be passive or active. Passive sensors collect information about energy that is reflected or emitted from the Earth, like reflected sunlight. NOAA scientists keep tabs on the sea surface temperature around the globe with a sensor on a satellite that measures infrared radiation emitted from the ocean surface. Active sensors produce their own energy. 
An example is a light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, system, which produces a beam of light and measures the time it takes to go to an object and back to determine the distance. NOAA pilots fly aircraft with LIDAR systems on board to map our coastlines and chart depths of the nearshore waters. These missions track changes of the coastline over time, as well as provide vital data to reopen ports after hurricanes or tropical storms strike. Satellites can also be used to collect and relay information from sensors in remote locations, like a telemetry tag on a whale or sea turtle. In addition to tracking the animal's movements, these tags can collect data about the animal's behavior and environment, helping us develop programs for their conservation and protection. NOAA is an agency that enriches life through science. Remote sensing helps our scientists extend their reach from the surface of the sun to the depths of the ocean floor as we work to keep the public informed of the changing environment around us. We're joined by Tim Walsh, Deputy Director of OSPO. Tim, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for coming today. Tim, can you tell us what is the Satellite Operations Facility? Satellite Operations Facility is the center of the universe for the work we do. We basically control all of our satellites from this location. And why is that important to the public? It's so important because if you're trying to get out of the way of a hurricane or you're trying to predict what tornadic activity would look like over the middle of the United States, that's so important. Can we go inside and look around? Absolutely. Let's go. So are these each trained on a different satellite? They are. In fact, we're, this is pulling down a lot of the initial science data from the satellite. This is where we do the data processing here. Wow. There are three primary functions that we do a lot uh, here at the uh, computer room in the control center is we do command and control, which is really how to talk to the satellites, send commands up and receive that telemetry down, product processing and distribution, when we take the instrument data off and kind of calibrate it, navigate it, and then send it out to the users. And then we also archive it here. So it's a giant su supercomputer. It is. There's a, an amazing array of hardware here that's, that's constantly uh, chunking away at data. After you. The people that are here in the control center are basically talking to the satellite. They're getting information about the status of the satellite and the instruments. And we're also telling them what to take images of at any given time. And so this is where we fly all the satellites. We actually fly 15 satellites out of this, this room. And they're split into two families of satellites. We have so, so things called low Earth orbiters. And they zip around the Earth about uh, every 90 minutes or so, 14 times a day. And they gather data globally. So we, can, we use a lot of that data for modeling in our weather forecasting. The low Earth orbiting satellites are really the workhorses of our, of our stable of satellites, so to speak. But as, as we walk over to the GO side, that's where we fly these satellites. Uh, they're called geostationary, and that means they're 22,500 miles away. And at that, at that altitude, you're basically orbiting once per day. And so from the ground, you look like you're not moving, which is really, really valuable when you're trying to track a, a severe storm, like a hurricane, and anything that might require instant updates. Right now, the US has two primary locations, one over the East Coast and one over the West Coast. And by doing that, we can see weather that's forming over the west coast of Africa all the way over to New Zealand. So you think about it, almost more than one half of the Earth we can cover with these two vantage points. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, we're going to go to the launch control room now. Launch control room. So yes, this is where all the action is during a launch. And for us in the coming year, we actually have two launches. The area to our right um, is actually uh, for the geostationary launches. It's configured for the GO satellites. And then to my left here, this is where uh, the low Earth orbiting, or um, it's, we call it JPSS. Can you define data for us? Data is basically information from the satellite that we can use in a number of different ways. The data comes down in ones and zeros. It's strictly ones and zeros. And then what we do on the ground is we process it. What types of information are you gathering? Some of the most notable information is the, is the visible imagery. We have visible and infrared imagery coming off the imager that can take less than one kilometer resolution data in 15 different wavelengths. And then we could do a little uh, section like a hurricane section every minute. So it's really phenomenal. How important is the other data collected by NOAA, whether it be from airplanes or weather balloons or drones, to this data coming in from satellites. You know, a satellite provides a, a unique set of observations. Uh, it's always complemented by what I would consider more ground truth. 
And that data is also fed into the modeling. And if you can analyze the data, improve the modeling, it's really using data from a number of different observations. Every day we're doing what we call like a quality assurance on all the data. There's a lot of quality checks that if there's noise involved, if there was a, a problem with the imager, that we also have a backup satellite on orbit. In case there's a problem, we can immediately bring up that other one and bring it into, into operation. Tim, thank you so much for showing us around today. It was a real pleasure having you guys. Thank you for coming. Using data isn't something that just NOAA does. You can try this at home. Hi, I'm Sam. Have you ever looked at a weather map to see if it was going to rain? Have you seen severe radar maps for a tornado or a hurricane? They can be really scary, but do you know what they represent or how they're made? Maps like this are created using data, but what does that mean? For our example today, our data is going to be numbers that represent the wind speeds inside a hurricane. We've plotted these wind speeds across the grid. You can look at the grid and see what's happening inside the storm, but it isn't very visual and isn't easy to use. Typically, weather maps break these down into wind speeds into categories. On our map, we've decided to break it down into these categories. Our wind speeds are recorded in knots because boats and planes calculate their speed in knots because a knot is equal to one nautical mile. Nautical miles are used because they are equal to a specific distance measured around the Earth. Since the Earth is circular, the nautical mile allows for the curvature of the Earth. A knot is equal to about 1.15 miles per hour. Next, we are going to assign colors to each category. In this case, we are assigning the colors of small chocolate candies. Once we have assigned colors to wind speeds, we can convert our data or numbers into a picture. We do this by placing the correct color of candy on the map. There are 900 points of data on this map, so I brought my friends Eli, Rory, Asher, and Wyatt to help! Let's go! So remember, when you see a weather map, it is an image created based on data. Weather balloons have been around for a long time. You may have even heard of a famous one that landed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Weather balloons have changed over time, but they are still used today. And they continue to collect important data. A large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, and rather tough paper and sticks. These were the words that rancher W.W. Mack Brazell used to describe the debris found on his property on June 14, 1947. This bit of stuff set off a chain reaction triggering an investigation by Roswell Army Airfield's 509th Composite Group, and on July 8, the Roswell Daily Record ran the headline, RAAF Captured Flying Saucer on Ranch in the Roswell Region. But was it really a flying saucer? It was not. What was found at the ranch that day in 1947 were pieces of a large high-altitude balloon the U.S. Air Force equipped with microphones to listen for nuclear bomb tests in the Soviet Union, a prospect that was far more frightening than a UFO at that time. Studying the upper atmosphere has been around for a long time. In the 1800s, kite observation stations were established by the United States Weather Bureau, today's National Weather Service, for taking observations. Using kites had some disadvantages, mainly that you can't fly kites as high as balloons. Higher flights allow for much better weather readings. NOAA has been using weather balloons for a long time too, and still does today. Nope, it's not a UFO. It actually says on the back and on my side too, harmless weather instrument. This is a radio sign, a balloon-borne instrument used by the National Weather Service to obtain weather data aloft for weather forecast and research. It is not dangerous. Please dispose of properly. My name is Brandon Rubin Ostra. I'm a, a lead forecaster at the National Weather Service here in Sterling, Virginia. Overall, we focus on protecting lives and property through severe weather warnings. But besides that, we also just issue your regular forecasts you'll see at our website, weather.gov. So we do a weather balloon launch twice a day. So in daylight time, we issue at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. local. 
So when time comes to do the weather balloon launch, I need to fill up the balloon with the hydrogen. And then from there, it like inflates for about 12 to 14 minutes. And at that point, I'll get together all the materials, the parachute and the radio sign and clean unpackaging it. And the data we collect with this instrumentation really enhances the production of our forecasts. The weather model is basically just a little fancy way of predicting what the weather is gonna do. It takes in all the math and physics and it spits it out onto your computers where you can look at the weather information in a very simple way. We have the balloon which is about four to five feet in diameter by the time it inflates fully which takes about 12 to 14 minutes. And then below that we have about 70 to 80 foot of feet of string and that will go to the actual radio sun. So we get this information through radio waves. We're able to get the information as it goes up back to our radar here, which will then get us that information real time into our computers. And we get information about every second or two. Everyone growing up wants to be something and I always wanted to be a meteorologist. Not only because I find the weather fascinating, but also to help people. So all the times you watch TV and see something scrolling across the screen, tornado warning, severe thunderstorm warning, it may annoy someone, but in reality, we're helping people. We're helping people take cover. These balloons, all the information we get from radars, all these things together help us uh, do that mission. Did you know that teachers can launch their own weather balloons with their students and collect data? Members of the museum's Teacher Innovator Institute simultaneously launched medium altitude balloons from all across the country. I'm, I'm pretty excited right now, Marty. Our, our balloon actually made it all the way back around the world. Three, two, one, let her go! We, we launched it from right here in Richland, Washington, and around four in the morning a couple days ago, it kind of drifted past us. Um, yeah, because it's solar powered, it, I call it woke up in Montana, because that's when the sun came down and charged it up and the capacitor could send out a ping. And so uh, we watched it that day, but it was in the jet stream. It was moving hard and fast. And so it woke up in Montana, it fell asleep in Minnesota, cut through South Dakota that day. Uh, then overnight, it kind of swooped up north over the Great Lakes, up through Quebec, but it's on the APRS network. And if there's no repeaters, there's no way to know exactly where it is, but we have some good predictions from the weather patterns. This is kind of ideal virtual education. You know, we're, we're not meeting in class yet, and um, uh, we don't need to right now. We can track this balloon. We can use um, the NOAA high split model. That's the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. They have an online model generator so my kids can daily uh, update with our GPS and um, altitude uh, data that's coming back from the telemetry. And we can make some predictions about where it's gonna go. And I launch one balloon and I can spend weeks talking about the data. My class is actually downloading the data into some ArcGIS software and we're making some comparisons between what kind of solar energy do we have versus what's the speed doing to see if there's a tilt on the solar panels. Um, is there a, can we find some patterns in the temperature versus the altitude? Um, but not only that, because I'm an integrated teacher with, uh, there's a history teacher, she can look at a map like this right here, and we can start talking about why are there different rules and regulations over different countries. We get into um, the, the civics of it, we get into why is Yemen blacked out, why is North Korea blacked out, um, what, what's going on in these different countries that make different laws that seem like it's just a radio. One balloon and my virtual learning is set. I got a chance to fly through Hurricane Florence with the United States Air Force. Florence was a Category 4 hurricane that made landfall in 2018. But the Air Force isn't the only one who flies through these giant storms. NOAA does also to gather vital information. The job of a hurricane hunter is not for the faint at heart. These brave men and women must fly straight into one of the most destructive forces in nature. Hurricanes are born over the open ocean. And while satellites can track their movement, meteorologists and researchers need to sample the storms directly to get the most accurate information about them. NOAA's Hurricane Hunter fleet includes two P-3 turboprop aircraft, as well as a Gulfstream 4 jet. The P-3s fly through the storm, encountering devastating winds that can be over 150 miles per hour. 
the jet can fly higher than the turboprops, gathering data from the upper atmosphere. Both planes have high-tech equipment on board to get the job done, like radar and fixed probes that measure particles in the air. Scientists also deploy drop wind sonds, which parachute down through the hurricane to the ocean surface, sending back data on pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind. These measurements can help us understand the structure of a storm and the winds that are steering it. The data is used in computer models that help forecasters predict how intense the hurricane will be and where and when it will strike land. Hurricane hunters take a literal look into the eye of a monster formed by nature. Their courage helps further science, which saves lives. We've been talking about remote sensing. Now it's time for a remote interview. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Hey guys, how's it going? Nice to see you. Can you tell us, first of all, how are drones used to assess tornado damage? We have one of those uh, quadcopters, so a smaller drone. We get some aerial shots and some videos so that we can really understand the magnitude of the tornado damage. Then we have another drone, which is a fixed wing with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities that we use to map the area and do some analysis to really tease out some of the tornado damage. For the quadcopter, we're basically manually flying that using an app. When it comes to the fixed wing, we actually plan the mission out. In the software, we'll draw a polygon around the area of our interest. I want 70 to 75% overlap so that I can get 3D modeling capabilities. Once we set up that mission, it's uploaded and sent to the drone. So then when we actually fly the fixed wing, we're really pressing a few buttons. It takes off and it goes and it, it does its mission. How do you use the data once it's collected? So with our fixed wing, we're actually collecting uh, two types of data. So we're collecting visible imagery and we're also collecting multispectral imagery. So we have two cameras. Vegetation will emit energy in near infrared bands. So in this portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see. So the nice thing about using a multispectral camera is that it allows us to assess damage to vegetation that we would not be able to see in that visible portion. We have to process this data. So when we go out and we fly, you know, one mission could collect thousands of individual images at, at a place. We use uh, software to be able to then stitch and line up all this imagery so that we have one continuous image that we can then look at and see a complete picture of tornado damage. Why is this information so important? We need to validate the tornado warnings, but we also need to understand the high wind impacts on the ground. So what areas were impacted, what the potential intensity was of the tornado. Because when we actually go out and survey these areas, the damage surveys are a way for us to help better understand what the tornadic intensity was. Thanks so much for talking with us. Adults aren't the only ones who can program and fly drones. Our friends at Stonehill Middle School programmed their own drones. And let me tell you, they blew us away. Just as NOAA scientists program drones to fly specific patterns over tornado damage, the students at Stonehill Middle School were challenged to program drones to fly specific missions. Their task was to program drones to fly a series of aerial maneuvers. But we didn't stop there. Students also had to sync their drones' movements to their own musical compositions that they also created with code. Their drones had to do flips, spins, fly in formations of up to four drones at a time. Each drone was programmed to follow a unique set of instructions using the student's code. Just like engineers, the students had to test their programs, fail and learn from those failures, reflect on their work, and then regroup to fix mistakes and start that process all over again until their drones were ready to do what they wanted them to. The final air shows were pretty impressive.
These skills the students showed by being able to program drones to fly to a specific location for a specific task directly relate to the processes used by NOAA to assess tornado damage. Who knows? In a few years, maybe some of these students will be working for NOAA and collecting important information about go. our planet. That was awesome! Data validation is a big, kind of scary term. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with me? But it has a lot to do with you, and it's got real-world implications. Validating data is making sure that the quality and accuracy of the data is correct before you use it. Kind of like checking your math before you turn in a test. Hi, I'm Tom Jones, a planetary scientist and veteran astronaut. I've got my PhD from the University of Arizona in remote sensing of asteroids, looking for water on the surfaces of asteroids out between Mars and Jupiter. And then I've been able to employ that same training in orbital missions, looking at our changing planet through the Space Radar Lab missions in particular. I flew four times on the space shuttle back during the 1990s and 2000s, uh, 53 days in space overall with a trip to help build the International Space Station. The other three missions were science missions, and in, in particular, two of them were really interesting to me as a planetary scientist. I got to study our planet from space using an advanced radar camera, map the changing surface of the Earth. We took our space shuttle, Endeavour, with the radar inside the cargo bay here, we rolled it over to face the surface of the Earth, as you see here on my backdrop, and we scanned the surface of the Earth with a radar beam, listened to the echoes coming back to the shuttle's cargo bay, and transformed those radar echoes into digital images. It used three different colors, wavelengths of three centimeters wide, six centimeters wide, and 23 centimeters across. And by using those three different wavelengths or colors of radar light, we could light up the Earth's surface below, listen to the echoes coming back, and the computers aboard Endeavour could combine those radar echoes into digital images of the planet. We could look at everything from how much carbon is in the forests that we see below us on the Earth. We could look for pollution in the oceans. We could map earthquake faults and watch erupting volcanoes. It's a very versatile instrument that, could, that can study almost every aspect of Earth science. I and mean, we're still studying those images 25 years later. So ground truth is the idea that you must prove that your observations from space are accurate by going to the site on the ground that you're looking at and collecting the detailed information about that site to see what the truth is on the ground so that you can correct or make more accurate the radar imagery that you're recording in space. And if we could prove by ground truth that our space observations were accurate, then we can take data all around the planet where we don't have investigators on the ground. And by using that extension, we can get accurate data all over the surface of the earth. But data validation isn't just something that scientists do, it's something students do as well. You may not realize it, but you work with data all the time. From seeing what the temperature is to working the math problem at school, validating data can be as simple as making sure the forecast you are looking at is for where you live or checking your work to make sure your answer on a math problem makes sense. If you're doing a simple addition problem and you get a really large number, your data might not be valid. Checking your work Validating your data can be an important step to success in school and in dressing appropriately to play outside. The next time you check the weather to see if you need to wear a jacket. Or check the prediction on severe weather. You can thank remote sensing and the work that the people at NOAA do. Have you used remote sensing in your life? Let us know down in the comments section. And if you like this video, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.